Right now, we are going to be talking about Chapter 19 from the book Anatomy and Physiology about the cardiovascular system. So right now, we're going to be talking about white blood cells, which is right here. Now, white blood cells are one of the formed elements. If we look at a picture of the percentage of formed elements that are in the blood, we see that if you look at your blood, your blood is made up of 55% plasma and 45% formed elements. Of the formed elements, you have red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Right now, we're going to be talking about the, red, uh, the white blood cells. So, with white blood cells, we have five different types. We have, um, we have the neutrophils, the eosinophils, the basophils, the monocytes, and lymphocytes. And here is a little picture. So, right here are the five different types of white blood cells. The first category you hear are called the granulocytes. These three, the ones that end in fill, basophil, eosinophil, and neutrophil. These are the agranulocytes. And when you put an A in front of something, it means the opposite of. So this one means that it has granules, granulocytes, and this one means it does not have granules. Like um, the word normal and abnormal. Adding an A means the opposite of. So the reason why these are called granulocytes is because they contain miniature granules here that you can see in the picture. Um, you cannot really see them too well. You cannot really see any granules in these. So what happens is um, when you want to identify uh, a white blood cell under the microscope, you um, can put a stain or a dye into the into the solution, and if they pick up a stain, it can help identify what type of white blood cell it is. So basophils, for example, will stain with basic dye, hence base, basophil. Eosinophils will stain with acidic dye, and neutrophils, since hence the word neutral, will stain with either basic or acidic. Now, lymphocytes and monocytes, how you can differentiate between them is that lymphocytes are the littlest of the white blood cell, L for little, and um, M for major, for biggest. Okay, now back to white blood cells. White blood cells have a nucleus, and they're also capable of moving. Their movement is called diapedesis, and it re is referred to as um, amoeboid movement. So they can move as an amoeba does. Um, they don't move around like we do, but they kind of act like an amoeba. Now, if you can have a hard time remembering the word diapedesis, just look at the root word here, ped. Think of a podiatrist um, who works with feet, or the word pedestrian um, has to do with walking around. So diapedesis is referring to um, the white blood cells moving. Now, um, part of the white blood cells moving is um, what's called chemotaxis. Now what happens is chemotaxis is basically going to signal a white blood cell to come and phagocytize a bacteria, dirt, or dead cells, or viruses, or whatever. Now, um, phagocytize, right here, that word here, is just a fancy word for eating. So if we look at, here's a white blood cell. We can think of them as Pac-Men, because they chomp up and eat all the bad guys, like all the germs, the foreign invaders that we don't want. So this act of the white blood cell eating up all the bad stuff, it's called phagocytosis. So when a white blood cell phagocytizes, it basically just gets rid of it. Um, after a white blood cell phagocytizes bacteria or whatever, it dies and collects in an accumulation of what's called pus. So next time you have a cut and it gets infected and you see a lot of pus, you can basically consider that a white blood cell graveyard because um, basically they sacrifice themselves for you to keep you healthy. Now, back to chemotaxis, what happens is when you get um, a cut or something, so let's let's draw like your skin layer here, and you have maybe a nail that pierced your skin and introduced for foreign invaders into your system, what's going to happen is chemical signals are going to be released into the bloodstream, and um, what's going to happen is that the white blood cells floating around are going to pick up on these chemicals and then rush towards where the chemicals are because they know that that's signaling that foreign invaders are here. 
So this process here is called chemotaxis. We have the root word chemical, chemo, and then taxis. You can think of this like a taxi. Like when you're trying to get a taxi's attention, you hail a taxi. Um, so what's happening is the chemicals are trying to signal or hail a white blood cell to come to the rescue. So you're trying to hail the white blood cell just like you would try to hail a taxi. So that's what the chemicals are doing. They're hailing the white blood cells to come and phagocytize the bacteria. Now, um, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about each type of, of white blood cell. We've got the neutrophils, eosinophils, basinophils, lymphocytes, and the monocytes. So let's start with the neutrophils. Um, neutrophils, basically the most important thing you need to know about them is that they are the first responders, meaning when you first have a foreign invader get into your bloodstream, they're going to be the first ones there. It says the first of the white blood cells to respond to infection. So let's say you get a blood sample drawn by your doctor and they notice that you have a very, very high um, neutrophil count. That probably means that you've been recently infected with uh, an acute infection, meaning something like a cold or a flu, something that's going to make you get sick really fast. It's something you can generally get over in like a week. Um, also, what they do is they secrete something called lysozyme. Lysozyme is an enzyme that you can find in your spit or saliva, um, your tears, and also in breast milk. And what lysozyme does is it um, breaks down certain bacteria. So this is very useful. Um, neutrophils can secrete that. And secrete just means to like give off or ooze out. Um, next one we have is the eosinophils. The eosinophils, like we mentioned before, are going to stain with a acidic stain. They're going to turn bright red under the microscope. Now what these got, this one does is that they tend to um, enter into the tissues when there's an inflammatory reaction. Generally, um, an inflammatory reaction is from an allergy, maybe like someone got stung by a bee or that sort of thing. So... Um, you're going to find um, a lot more evidence of eosinophils in your bloodstream when you're having an allergic reaction. And, and typically people who have allergies are going to have a higher count of eosinophils as well. What they're going to do is they're going to try to destroy the inflammatory chemicals such as histamine. Histamine is one of those things that increases inflammation. So eosinophils are going to try and um, reduce that. Eosinophils are also useful um, to attack parasites and worms and all, the, all, all sorts of other things you don't really want in your body. The next one, basophils, they're going to stain with a basic dye. Now what these are going to do is they're also going to migrate through the tissues and they also increase in number um, when there's an allergic or inflammatory re reaction just like the eosinophils. However, these ones are the ones that contain the histamine and they're going to want to increase inflammation. And they're also going to release something called Heparin, which in inhibits blood clotting. Heparin um, for nursing is important because heparin is a blood thinner. So it can help to thin the blood if that is an issue. Other one is lymphocytes. Lymphocytes are the littlest, babyest white blood cell. What they're important for is um, they include the B cells and T, B cells, and T cells. Um, generally, you're going to find lymphocytes in the lymphatic tissues, the lymph nodes, the tonsils, all that sort of thing. That's where you're going to find these guys. Now, the B cells, what they do um, is that they are going to be in charge of producing antibodies. Now, antibodies are um, the thing that happens when an, a microorganism is introduced into your bloodstream. And um, let me just draw a little picture real quick. Let, let's say this is a germ. Now, all, the, all cells contain what's called antigens, which basically are markers to identify who it is. So let's say this one has a triangle as a marker. And some people don't understand that, some people don't understand the concept of an antigen. I like to describe it as like um, how different teams wear jerseys to identify themselves. Like someone might wear a red jerseys or like a blue jersey to, to the, hey, this is our team, this is who we are, to identify themselves. So this germ is um, going to be wearing its antigen, or its jersey, which is going to be a triangle in this case. Now this is a, a, a germ that we don't want inside of our body. So inside of our body we have what's called antibodies. So um, antibodies are shaped exactly like the antigen so they can bind to it, and then latch on and um, basically signal the white blood cells to come and destroy it. 
So if a germ is floating by in the bloodstream and an antibody sees it and knows that it's a match, it's going to link on and bind to it like that. Um, so let's say another one, we have like a square, so, and these two germs are floating around. This antibody is going to bind with this one. This one's not shaped for this, so it's not going to attack that one. Now, this um, is an issue when, say, a germ comes into your circulation with a specific shape that you don't have an antibody for. It's in something new you've never been exposed to before, and so no antibodies are going to latch onto it because you don't have that antibody already made for it. So typically it will get you sick, and then after you get sick, you know, and your body recognizes a threat, then you'll start establishing and making that antibody. So the next time around, you know, you'll recognize it earlier, start attacking it, and won't get sick. So that's the importance of maybe like vaccines, for example. Let's say this is a polio virus, and you don't want to get polio, obviously. So what they're, do what they're gonna do is in the vaccine, they're gonna inject a weak, weakened version or maybe a dead version of this um, of this germ into you so that it won't really get you too sick because it's weak. And so, because it takes a while for your antibodies to, to be created. So after a while, you will produce the antibodies. And when you actually, if you ever do come in contact with a live polio virus, your antibodies will be ready and you'll already have that um, in your bloodstream. So back to back to that. Um, that's what the B cells are going to be doing. They're going to be producing, um, antibodies. Those are very important. Um, then T cells, which are another type of lymphocyte, are going to protect against viruses. And also they're going to, um, help in destruction of tumor cells. Now, if you have to, if you're having a hard time remembering which one does which, the B or the T, try to think of it as B for bodies. B cells make antibodies, B and B. And then T, T cells attack tumors and attack. So T's attack tumors, T, T, T. Just that, you know, word repetition, that sound. And um, the last one, monocytes, they are the biggest ones of all the white blood cells. And they usually only remain in circulation for only about three days. After that, they turn into what's called macrophages. And macrophages are like the vacuum cleaners of your body because they basically suck up all the stuff you don't want floating around, like dead cells, cell fragments, and other debris. Um, and if you had an increase of monocytes in your bloodstream, a doctor can probably tell that you've been having a chronic infection for a long time. So this is uh, basically um, all you need to know about the white blood cells.